You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. And now, here's two guys who can sing Auld Lang Syne in 10 different languages, Evan and Joe. I'm Joe Tykotsky down in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm Evan McFarlane here in the off season in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, Canada. And you're watching episode 64 of Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. This is indeed our final episode of the calendar year 2024. All right, big guy, what do you have planned for New Year's Eve? Um, I'm not entirely sure. We usually have a house full. We're, we're pretty well known for having uh, parties. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there's, there'll be some people coming over. A couple New Year's ago, we had a, a dress-up theme, so I think we're bringing that back. Have a big, big uh, black tie event at our house, maybe. <laughs> very nice, very nice. On uh, New Year's Eve, I... We'll be making sure my car doesn't get stolen like it did last New Year's Eve. Man, that's oh man. A, and I that's was big going. goals, man. Wait. Yeah, yes, exactly. Crazy night. <laughs> a U.S. New Year's Eve. All right, let's quickly move into the music spotlight. And we have a double play, play, play. Um, I've got a husband and wife instrumental pop duo from Calgary named Ginger Beef. She's an award-winning flutist. And I swear to you, he is the organist for the Calgary Flames. That's really? Uh, they do a remake of the early 70s instrumental hit Hocus Pocus, which was originally done by a forgotten group named Focus, I swear. Check them out, Ginger Beef. And we'll also highlight a group called the Wilderness of Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And that picture there you see certainly screams Wilderness of Manitoba. <laughs> and their song is called The First Snowfall. So any snow up there yet? Uh, yeah, we've had a little bit. Uh, first off, Wilderness of Manitoba are awesome. They're a great band. I, I really do like them. Um, yeah, we, we've actually got some snow on the ground, but it's uh, it's going to leave. <laughs> we have had none, and we would like to keep it that way. So. <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, time for a short break, but when we come back with an athletic director from a place where the school sports teams have to take a ferry to get to every single road game. You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV in St. Andrews. Welcome back to Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. Grand Manan is an island in the Bay of Fundy and the largest of the Fundy Islands. It's 21 miles long with a maximum width of 11 miles and has a population of 2,596. In the late 1700s, the United States considered Grand Manan to be in its possession due to its proximity to Maine and, fun fact, in the late 1800s, Grand Manan was the largest supplier of smoked herring in the entire world. Grand Manan has a K through 12 school, which has about 400 students in its 13 grades. And every one of its high school sports teams must take a 90 minute ferry ride, followed by a drive of anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes just to get to every single road game. To talk about this unique sports lifestyle, Joining us on the show is one of the athletic directors at Grand Manan Community School, Emma Stafford. Emma, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, you and Amanda Russell serve as athletic directors at the school, as well as being phys ed teachers. Did, did you grow up on the island? I did grow up on the island. Um, I moved off at the age of 18, though, and did not move back until about five years ago at the age of 30. So all of my 20s were off the island, but I did grow up here. But Amanda herself did not grow up here. She grew up in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and then she met um, my cousin in university and moved to Grand Manan after university. All right. Now, what varsity sports does the high school currently offer? We offer golf for the boys, and we have both senior and JV boys basketball. Usually there is a senior boys basketball team as well, but this season it just didn't work out, so we went to the JV route, and we also offer volleyball. Sometimes there's a baseball team, but this year we decided to try out golf because there wasn't enough for the baseball team. Okay. Evan? Yeah, and 
so living on Graham and Ann, everything is, is fairy based and uh, looking at like participation for your school sports, do you see having to take a ferry to all away games kind of a deterrent to get players on the teams? I definitely don't think it deters the players because as we've grown up here, we're just used to it. It's part of our lifestyle. Um, my husband coming from England, he moved here and he had to get used to the whole hour and a half trip is just planned into our day. It does not bother us. We know that we leave at 730 in the morning and that's just part of our day. So <laughs> player wise, I don't think it deters anything. But with parent participation, traveling to away games, I do believe that that plays a huge factor in the parents traveling and supporting our teams on away games. Okay. Now for our viewers and for the ones up in Canada, they may know it a little bit better. The ones in the States that, that watch will be totally unfamiliar. Say you're playing a weeknight game at a school like Harvey mm -hmm. high school. Give me a sample time schedule for the day. Do the kids get out of school early or what time does the ferry leave? So usually if they are very cooperative, which most teams are, we would plan a game so that we'd be allowed to come back on the 930 ferry that evening. So we would not have to spend the night overnight. So usually a game would be three o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon, something like that, so that we would have time to come home on the next on that late ferry. But saying that, we would have to leave on the 1130 ferry. So students would be taken from school a bit early. They have to be at the ferry by 1045, no later than that. Um, so they're missing half their day for sure in the, in the school day. And then we would be traveling an hour and 15 minutes once we got off the ferry. That's not including the hour and a half ferry ride, which for us, like I said, it's just it just plays into the time. Yeah. Um, and then travel an hour and a half, or yeah, an hour and 15 in cars, play the game, then an hour and 15 back, jump on that nine o'clock ferry. They say it's a 930 ferry, but it really loads and leaves that last ferry. So, and then they're not getting home until 1030 PM. So it's about a 12 hour day for them, um, just to play a one game. That's wow. crazy. crazy. Yeah. Evan. Yeah. And, and I know this trip fairly well. I mean, I'm used to making it once, if not twice a year, um, but since you do it so often, has, has the novelty kind of worn off? I know our kids, like, they have a good time. They think it's, it's neat mm -hmm. to go on the boat. Um, I'm not a huge boat person, so I usually take a bunch of gravel and go lie down and say, you're not my kids, leave me alone. But uh, <laughs> most of your players use the time on the ferry to catch up on homework, or do they just, they just relax and go with it? We definitely have a rule at our school that if your homework is not finished or your ho or your classwork's not completed, then you cannot play. So sometimes the coaches will come pick up the students work at school, make sure it's done on the ferry before the game is done. But as we know, teenagers nowadays looking at their phone half the time. So usually that's what they're doing. Now, myself growing up, I was talking to one of my um, high school players that I played with about this and how much fun it was to be on the ferry as a team. It was the team bonding. We had to dress up. We had to look nice. We always played this game Spoons where we bought spoons and played this oh, yeah. game. So <laughs> myself growing up, it was a wonderful experience. And it just always seemed like a team bonding moment, traveling away and traveling home. But nowadays, I think they just hang out, socialize watch videos on their phones, talk to each other on their phone, <laughs> that kind yeah, of thing. <laughs> but home is definitely something that does have to be finished in order for them to play if it was not completed that week. Awesome. I, think I can speak on behalf of our team too, that, uh, that unfortunately this year we're not going to the Daniel Park tournament just to, uh, due to other commitments, but we usually go every year. And that's it's 100% our best team bonding event of the year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I think definitely. how about if they if they don't do their homework just leave them on the ferry while the team <laughs> you know, gets off. Back and forth. They'd be headed, yeah they'd be headed right back home is the problem <laughs> <laughs> um I went one the year that I uh the two years that I coached we made one trip there for the tournament and um I just thought it was the most unique bizarre amazing kind of a team experience um you know mm -hmm. kids taking pictures outside and you know with the uh, the ocean in the background. And the thing that I thought was odd was seeing the people, the referees who are going to be refereeing your game on the ferry with you yeah. coming over there, um, yeah. you know, which I thought was a unique idea, but it was um, a pretty cool experience. Now you mentioned the latest, the ferry leaves um, Black Harbor to return to Graham and Anna's like nine 30 at night. Not it's it loads and leaves, so usually it's gone by there by nine oh five nine at the yeah nine nine oh five ish. Okay, so my question: What happens? Say game goes into overtime or something like that. Have any of your teams ever missed the ferry and then had to stay overnight or swam? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. You don't want to swim, that's for sure. <laughs> but yes, that has definitely happened for sure, um, especially in the past. And, and like I said, the ferry does not give you any leeway. That last ferry is a load and lead, a load and leave ferry. So the other ones are kind of on a schedule. You load at five, but you don't leave till 530. But that last ferry, they try to kind of get out of there as quick as possible. So if you miss that ferry, which has happened, you're heading back to, I mean, again, when I played in high school, you could stay at, at, at Black's Harbor. There was the Clipper ship or whatever those little hotels there but mm -hmm. nowadays I think that there isn't much room and correct me if I'm wrong but that I remember in Black Harbor for anybody to stay so it's you got to take your trip back to St. John or you sleep in your car until the next morning whatever it may be but it has definitely happened and they do not give you one minute of, of leeway that ferry if you're there at 531 you've missed the ferry as soon as that ramp starts going up then you are stuck on the other side <laughs> Uh, I remember one time when Evan's team was playing them and it wasn't a particularly close game. And they asked if you could, they could play running time the last quarter so they can yeah. make it to the ferry, which was another thing that I had never experienced <laughs> before. I, I told Evan to stop yeah. calling time out so they could get to the ferry on time. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, you have one more question? Oh man, I've, I've drove way too fast back to that ferry over in Graham and Ann. There was one a couple of years ago. Oh, there yes, was, we there was a snowstorm and I, I didn't think we were going to make it. I thought we were going to come around the last corner and the boat was going to be gone already, but we, uh, yeah, yeah, we duped the hazard and onto the back ramp. We made it, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's got, it's past, you have to see this as a home court advantage. I can imagine that for teams to have to travel mm -hmm. across and, uh, jump onto the court with their sea legs still, I, I know I've done one trip I can think of. Uh, it was the first year I coached, and it was almost the last year I coached, and it was the most miserable ride back. I, I thought for sure that was the end of my life that night, but um, it's <laughs> it's got to be. I mean, it's got to be nice having teams walk in cold off the boat, and you try to take it to them in the first quarter. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now I will say we have a new ferry as of oh my goodness, two thousand and I don't want to say. Oh, I don't know, 2009-ish, maybe? We got a new ferry, 2010, somewhere around there. So we got a new ferry, and that handles a lot more wind than our Graham and Ann 5. So when I, again, when I played in high school, we only had the Graham and Ann 5. And once there was 25 knot of wind, you thought, yes, somebody's going to be having some sea leg boat on the court. You <laughs> knew you were going to have a home court advantage. But now, I mean, yesterday, Harvey came over to play our girls last evening, and it was blowing a bit yesterday, but that ferry holds so much wind now that you wouldn't even feel it. So we want to hope that we get a little home court advantage, but the new ferry has taken that away a bit, but still there are some people that still can't even handle any knot of wind on the ferry, but Harvey right. did come yesterday and blew our girls off the court. So there was no home court advantage yesterday for us. <laughs> uh, I've got a couple of boys that can get seasick in a bathtub. So we're usually in rough shape when yeah, we get exactly. off. That thing. <laughs> I think you have to, yeah. I will, I, I will say, I will say too that, um, memories of myself growing up here and playing in high school we used to take a fishing boat or a couple fishing boats over to Campobello to play because it was just a half an hour ride in a fishing boat instead of an hour right. and a half ferry then a two-hour drive all the way around so cool. I mean there was some trips over in fishing boats too to get over there and play so it wasn't even though we were playing in another place we were feeling the effect of the ferry for sure <laughs> or the fishing boat yeah you know, cool experience though so you got to do is pay the ferry yeah. driver pay the ferry driver to rock it a little bit as the visitors come over well yeah. i won't make you annoyed and tell you that in new haven area i don't think anyone makes more than a 40 minute bus ride for any away games just because of the density but it is a uh, a neat and unique way to play games um she is yeah. emma stafford one of the athletic directors at Grand Manan Community School, where they take a ferry to all their away games. Quite a unique situation for anyone that's a non-islander. Uh, Emma, thanks so much for being on the show. No problem at all. Thanks for having me. Our right, pleasure. Okay. And after the break, Small Town Spotlight heads to Yukon, but that's Y-U-K-O-N, not U-C-O-N-N. You're watching Mick and T Sports Report on CHCO TV. Welcome back to Small Town Spotlight on CHCO TV and Mick and T Sports Report. With a population of 28,201, Whitehorse is the capital of Yukon and the largest city in northern Canada. During the Klondike Gold Rush of the late 1800s, 
It was the home of one Frederick Trump, grandfather of little Donnie. As many of you know, I went to the University of Connecticut, which is also known as UConn. Well, our first guest is a graduate student at UConn, but this one is UConn University in Whitehorse, a mere 3,792 miles away from my UConn. So to tell us about life at UConn U, Y-U-K-O-N, let's welcome in Taylor Belansky. Taylor, welcome to the show. Good morning. Okay, now, born in Vancouver, you went to D.W. Poppy Secondary School in Langley, British Columbia. What extracurricular activities did you do in high school? So at my high school, I did a lot of dance, uh, jazz, tap, ballet, all the kinds that I could do. I also played hockey, a little bit of ringette, and my favorite was rugby. Okay. Now quickly, ringette, what is that? Because I've oh, never heard of it. <laughs> ringette, it's it's a, it's kind of like a modified, I think like way back when they kind of modified hockey for women. And so it's kind of, it's a little bit of different rules. It's played on ice. You've got skates on. The gear is a little bit different. But instead of like a hockey stick with a curved blade at the end, it's just a stick. Like it's like a stabby kind of stick. And you play with, instead of a hockey puck, a rubber ring. So okay. the ring's about like that size. It's bigger than a hockey puck. Gotcha. And it's very fast. It's, 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 uh, goes a lot faster than hockey. You don't get kind of stuck in corners and stuff like that. It's a lot of quick skating. So it's, it's very similar to hockey, but a little bit of a different skill set. Good. I like it. Now you started your studies around 2016 at the university. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And Langley, where you grew up, it's, it's close to the U S border and Washington state about two hours from Seattle. Is that correct? All right, so now you graduate high school and decide to go 26 hours north of Langley to Whitehorse. Had you ever been there before? I had never been to Whitehorse, um, but when I was looking at what I wanted to do for university, I knew that I wanted to do something in environmental science. I found the environmental science program at the University of Alberta, and then I found through their website that I could do all four years at UConn University, which I thought was cool because my mom grew up in both Faro and Whitehorse in the Yukon, and she had grown up there. We always heard stories about the Yukon growing up, and it was just kind of like this big, like, I think what Alaska probably is to a lot of Americans, okay. you know, like it's the frontier. And so, uh, yeah, my mom kind of encouraged me to go. She's told me that I would really like it there. And so I chose to go there for my whole undergrad degree. And uh, I loved it when I first showed up. I remember thinking uh, the trees are small, uh, <laughs> especially compared to Langley. You know, we're in the temperate rainforest, basically uh, near Washington there. So we have huge trees, big, sharp mountains. So I remember thinking these mountains are kind of stubby. Uh, the trees are small. And I arrived at the end of August, which up here is actually fall. Like already the trees, the trees are changing color. And so I remember feeling like I'd kind of been like, plopped in this whole other world, but I've come to really, really love it here. Now, uh, during your undergrad years at UConn, was there much on campus in the way of social activities for students? So I, when I started at UConn University, we were actually still UConn College. So I've kind of seen the, you know, the college change to a university, and there's definitely been a shift in what's offered um, for students, but we're still not a big um, on-campus kind of like enclosed community. We're really a part of the broader Whitehorse community. So there are some social activities like different clubs, um, different like um, like sports groups and stuff on campus. But I think a lot of the students find um, social activities and social groups to fit into uh, in the broader Whitehorse community. Okay. See, when I went to UConn, uh, the question would have been, was there much in the way of academic options for students? <laughs> um, now, uh, academically, you started out in the Northern Science Program as an undergrad. What will your master's degree be in, and how long of a program is that? Yeah, so my uh, master's is in Earth Sciences. Uh, my thesis is really on uh, mine remediation, specifically in the north. We have a lot of mines here, so my project is looking at how to use uh, bacteria that actually, like, naturally exists on the land and kind of uh, developing water treatment systems to like reap the benefits of those natural bacteria in cleaning our mine water. 
Okay. Yeah, I actually saw you did an interview with CBC um, a little way back, and I was lost halfway through. It was very <laughs> impressive stuff, but it was uh, it, it, it was fascinating to see. Now, based on the degree you have and the one you'll get in the field of studies, say like five, 10 years from now, what do you see yourself doing? Yeah, so I really, when I think about the future, I want to do more of what I'm doing now, which is uh, researching and investigating how to clean up the mines that we have here um, using the most like natural passive processes uh, possible. So I'd like to continue to do that. And I would also like to work with communities that are impacted by mining. Um, we have uh, many active and abandoned mines here in the Yukon, and there's not one community that's untouched um, by the impacts of those mines. So I would really like to be working with communities and help making um, mining cleaner and cleaning up our abandoned mines. I don't know if you've heard of Faro Mine. Yes. Yep. Yeah, Faro Mine. So that's it's considered to be like the second most contaminated site in all of Canada, just after a nuclear waste uh, mm. uh, facility. So it's a massive problem. It's a huge contaminated site. It's going to take many, many, many years and a ton of work to clean up. And so I want to be part of that cleanup. Okay. Um, important work. That is for sure. All right, let's uh, transition a little bit to a few lighthearted non-school questions here. Um, favorite non-chain restaurant in Whitehorse? Yeah, this one is so hard. We really do have uh, a ton of amazing, incredible restaurants here, like uh, all the cuisine that you could think of. We're really wanting for nothing up here. Um, but my absolute favorite, always a good meal, always a good drink, is The Miner's Daughter. It's right on our main street in Whitehorse, and they have an adjacent bar called The Dirty Northern, which is also great food, great drinks, and good atmosphere. Okay. Favorite place in Canada to travel to that you've gone to? Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of Canada. I mean, it's so big, and I really grew up in the West, and so my favorite place uh, to visit is Vancouver Island. It's Especially coming from Whitehorse in the winter, Vancouver Island is like a tropical paradise. It's always green. Uh, the temperate rainforest is always green. There's amazing geography, geology, birds, wildlife, bears. Like there's just, it's a fantastic, amazing place. And there's a ton of small towns with a lot of charm. And it's, yeah, that's definitely my favorite place. Okay. Now, what part of Canada have you never been to that eventually you'd like to go to? a lot of Canada. I would like to see all of it someday. Um, but really the top of my list for a long time has been the Maritimes. I, I really want to see the East Coast. And we actually have a lot of people in the Yukon from the East Coast. So we hear, you know, like those new fee accents and stuff all the time. And I want to go see what it's all about. Okay, good answer. And that's where our show is uh, uh, comes out of in New Brunswick. And I'm sure they'll be happy to know that their accent is considered goofy. They uh <laughs> They consider mine odd and uh but you know that's what uh that's what makes it such a, a great area but it is that would be a a good bucket list place uh for you uh to go all right well she is grad student extraordinaire taylor Belansky of yukon university in whitehorse and she's promised me that she's going to get me one of her yukon u t-shirts um so i can proudly wear it here and i will uh, get one out to her, and uh, I'll be the only one here with a Y-U-K-O-N shirt. And on the flip side, you'll be the only one with a U-C-O-N-N shirt. Um, so to find out more about the school, you can go online to yukonu.ca. And Taylor, thanks so much for being on the show, and continue good luck with your studies and your upcoming thesis. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right. Welcome back, everybody. And Joe, it's good to see you uh, interviewing somebody from the Yukon with a Yukon sweatshirt on. So it's obvious that Captain Obvious is around one more time before the new year. <laughs> I made one appearance. Yes, it was. Um, when, it, when I had asked her for her first impression of Yukon University, all I could think of was my first impression of Yukon back in 1979. Classic quick story. My father drops me off, helps me unpack, and leaves to go home. And as I'm walking up the stairs to head back to my room on the third floor, I see a guy who I didn't know yet, but he was named Greg Saros, who looked a little bit like Charles Manson. And he is leaning out the third floor window, just puking his guts out. So uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, was my introduction to American college life. Amazing. 
Um, all right, let's go right to the shout outs. Uh, Evan, what do you have? You can take it this time. Yeah, I, I think I'm just going to keep this one appropriate for the time, but I'll just wish all my friends and family just a, a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Uh, for, for a lot of people, it's a, it's a fun time. For some people, it's a tough time. So just uh, everybody, I hope you have a, a safe holidays and uh, God bless. Well said. Well, that is it for episode 64 of Nick and T Sports Report. I'm Joe in New Haven. I'm Evan here in New Brunswick. Thanks to Patrick Watt and Florence Mitchell for being able to produce and edit our show while singing Christmas carols and drinking spiked eggnog. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy holiday season, everyone, and Happy New Year. We will see you all in 2024. This is McEntee Sports Report on CHCO-TV in St. Andrews.